from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo and this is From the South. On Tuesday, Grenadians and NT1M Arbutans will vote in a critical referendum to determine whether the Caribbean Court of Justice, or CCJ, will be the nation's final court of appeal. At the moment, the London-based Privacy Council has been retained as the final court of appeal for most Caribbean community member states, but not without rancor. By Wednesday, the seven CCJ judges may have a lot more work on their hands. If Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada sign on to the CCJ, they join Barbados, Belize, Dominica and Guyana as countries in the CCJ's jurisdiction as final appellate court. For many, having Caribbean judges serving as the ultimate arbiters is the final step toward true independence and full regional integration. Adopting the CCJ would replace the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council based in London, an obscure court which many feel is too far removed from the Caribbean and Caribbean issues and too reminiscent of the colonial past. Switching to the CCJ is also less costly and matters can be heard faster than the Privy Council. Everything is all set for the court to become as accepted as, for example, the University of the West Indies, or the Caribbean Development Bank, or the Caribbean Examinations Council. All Caribbean institutions run by Caribbean nationals working to promote the ethos and goals of a proud Caribbean people. But it's that distance, literal and figurative, that keeps many in the Caribbean from adopting the regional appellate court. Many people don't trust Caribbean judges, fearing they can be easily corrupted, despite countless measures to ensure that they aren't. Also, there have been no accusations of corruption in the court's 18-year history. Already no one ever do anything wrong. The mother got to write quite the queen. So let we remain there still. I acknowledge of the queen, of the, of the, um, CC, of the, queen um, the previous council. But we are ready for the CCJ yet. I know of it, I know the CCJ and what it means to us as a, as a, as a people. But if we decide to go off away from the, the queen, we have to go off from the, 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 the queen and off from Babylon entirely. It's been a long road to get here. The first proposal for a Caribbean Court of Appeal was tabled back in 1970. It wasn't until 2001 the first agreement to establish the Caribbean Court was signed by 10 states. Two more countries signed on a few years later, bringing the number to 12. Since 2005, the CCJ has been housed in this building in Port of Spain. Now, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has made no real steps to implement the CCJ as their final court of appeal. In one debate many years ago, the opposition said that there must be a referendum before that can happen. But there are only two countries which absolutely must have a referendum to implement the CCJ. That's Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada. And they are going to the polls very soon. Kijan Haynes, Telesur, Port of Spain. The Central American migrant caravan continues its march to the north. At least 2,500 migrants from the first caravan have already arrived in Mexico City. They are being housed at a sports stadium. Others decided to gather in Puebla to rest and wait for more, more migrants to arrive. And a few of those waiting in Puebla have hopped on the back of container trucks. Although they are cramped, they say this will help them reach their destination much faster. They hope to join the others by Monday evening. But the dangers for those migrants are ongoing. Their biggest fear is being detained by federal authorities so they can be sent back to their countries. Mexican authorities are still detaining migrants. Messages of support from various governors and even President Enrique Peña Nieto are of little comfort to them. They believe they are just for show. Since being on the road, immigration services continue to detain them. Sergio experienced the heavy-handed harassment by La Migra, what they call immigration services, who detained his wife and the rest of his group. A few minutes ago, they detained 25 of us, so the rest of us ran to the fields. They attacked us. Many women have bruises from being hit. That's why the various caravans are trying to join forces. They feel unity will make them stronger.
Todos juntos y unidos. Juntos y unidos. Juntos y unidos con todo, pues. The People Without Borders organization has condemned the abuse and excessive use of force by authorities against migrants. They need to stop attacking women and children. They need to stop violating their rights. If this is due to U.S. pressure, they need to detain us at their border, not in Mexican territory. After another dangerous leg of the journey, they arrived at Piji Japan's immigration checkpoint, which they crossed together to avoid more detentions. The constant threat by Mexican authorities is believed to be due to pressure of the U.S. government. Despite negative messages about the migrant caravan from the U.S. administration, many people believe they should be welcomed. That's the case of residents in the small Texas border town of San Elisario. People believe that members of the migrant caravan making its way towards the U.S. are hard-working people. Many of the inhabitants also have a migrant background, and they want new, new migrants to have the same chance they had when they arrived in the country. It's not an issue for me for any kind of immigrant coming in because they're humans, we're human too. We, are, we were born and we were taught how to treat them with respect. And members of the second migrant caravan in Mexico have to walk almost 100 kilometers every day, something that is only impossible, only possible due to the help and solidarity of the people from southern Mexico. Honduran migrants are not only heading north on foot, some are also on their way in vehicles thanks to the solidarity of Mexican drivers. Please everyone, calm down. We all are going to get in, but please let's do it in order. The high temperature of this region, as well as the length of the journey, is affecting children in particular. Cover children's heads, and please give them water so they don't dehydrate. Eladio is using his van to carry women and children from Piji, Japan, to the village of Arriaga. It is a 98-kilometer road, which would be near impossible to walk on foot. We have to show solidarity with our Salvadoran and Honduran brothers and sisters. It is how we should help protect life. Migrants have been receiving people's help in every step of their journey north. We are very grateful because they have helped us a lot with food and transportation. Thanks to God and to them, we are going to fulfill our dream. The group finally arrived at Riaga and can now rest. The perseverance of migrants plus Mexican solidarity have made one more stage in this trip possible. But they do not forget their next goal, to reunite with their first caravan in Mexico City. A day ahead of the midterm elections in the United States, President Donald Trump has been campaigning across the country. On Sunday evening, he was in Georgia, where the Democrat Stacey Abrams is hoping to become the first black woman governor in the history of the United States. Trump called Abrams one of the most extreme far-left politicians in the country. And once again, he warned that his government will not let the migrant caravan crossing Mexico enter the United States. And early voting is coming to a close across the country. People have been standing in lines to cast their ballots with reported wait times as long as two hours. In cities like Chicago, turnout was high with the largest number of ballots cast in the early morning hours. Experts believe that approximately 40 million early votes, including absentee votes by mail and in-person ballots will likely be cast by election day. Let's go to our correspondent, Jorge Gestoso, who brings us the latest on the elections from Washington. Today, on the eve of the midterms elections, President Trump is planning to be in Cleveland, Indiana, and Missouri, and former President Barack Obama in Virginia, trying to catch the last-minute votes. What is very interesting is that 35 million Americans, almost 35 million Americans, have voted early, and that has changed the predictability of the polls because many of them are first-time voters and they don't know exactly the way that they were going to vote. So it's still a big question mark what is going to happen tomorrow. Trends are indicating that most probably Democrats are going to gain the House of Representatives. The magic number is 23 seats that they have to recover. They believe that they're going to go further than that. But in the case of the Senate, most of the polls are indicated that most probably the Republicans are going to keep the majority on the Senate. 
On the other hand, this is conceived as being uh, is an agreement that is basically a referendum on the 22 months of the presidency of Donald Trump for weather, for worse, for better and worse, according to the pending did party uh, will do it. It's going to be a way to reaffirm what he's been doing so far. Mostly he has put emphasis in immigration and it's exacerbating hate and fear by the Democrats, what they are putting on the table in the message is health care. And uh, we have to see what is going to happen, but it's extremely unpredictable what we're going to see tomorrow. The presidency, according to the different polls, President Trump has about 46% of approval, 52% of disapproval, and that could play also a factor on both ways. So we are here and we're going to be doing uh, reporting all throughout the day and all throughout tomorrow to keep you posted on what's going on on these midterm elections. Thank you, Jorge. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Three Venezuelan soldiers guarding the border with Colombia have been killed in an attack by paramilitary forces. Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino Lopez has spoken about the murders and he condemned this act and warned that Venezuela has no place for paramilitary groups. Our men were ambushed. These people have murdered three members of our Bolivarian National Armed Forces. Three National Guards. They were killed in Amazonas by a criminal group that is a byproduct of the internal war that exists in Colombia. In Venezuela, there is no room for armed groups that work outside the law, no room for paramilitary groups. We reject the inability of the Colombian state to not control these paramilitary groups, their violence and their drug trafficking. This week, the lower house in Brazil is set to debate the school without a party project, or as it's commonly referred to, the school with a gag law. Stakeholders from the educational sector join forces with social movements in Brazil to reject the schools without a political party project. They say it will legalize political persecution of teachers and will reinforce the sexist and homophobic culture of the new government. The elected president Bolsonaro even said that he will close all the field schools. To him, these schools are ideological. They will create schools based on their experience, their culture, their reality. To us, a school has to have guarantees from the municipality and the state. The approval of the project will prevent teachers from addressing gender issues, sexuality and race. Some politicians are even calling for students to have the right to freedom of speech in the classroom, so they may challenge teachers with critiques of the new president-elect, Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro is even known for calling for the persecution of academics. The president-elect, even before being elected, already said that all those schools will be closed. That means illiteracy will return. What we are defending is education and the constitutional right all children have to an education. The project puts the job of thousands of teachers at risk and will set back scientific research, the plurality of thought and the critical formation of young people. Closing our schools is a clear persecution of the movement and the denial of the right to education to the children who are in the field. So we have several measures of this government that are going against the movements. According to experts, the School Without a Political Party project will give a military intelligence organizations significant power, leading to a witch hunt similar to that of the opposition during the military dictatorship period. Days prior to the presidential runoff, military and electoral authorities raided 20 schools to prevent discussions on democracy confiscated anti-fascist banners and impersonate teachers. Prison workers unions in Chile have called for a national strike. They announced they will block all entrances to the country's prisons. 
We're starting a national strike of all prison workers right now. Each one of us in each prison needs to be united and stand strong with dignity for the future of prison workers in Chile. Jamaica's Finance and Public Service Minister, Dr. The Hon Nigel Clark, says 90% of outstanding debt of to China will be repaid in 10 years. Dr. Clark confirmed that 99% of loans from China are secured at fixed interest rates of 2 and 3%, the lowest in Jamaica's loan portfolio. Speaking at Latin Finance's Third Caribbean Finance and Investment Forum in New Kingston, he added that loans from China only represent 3.9% of their 2 trillion US dollar debt. Experts in Argentina expect inflation rates to rise as high as 47.5% for 2018, the highest since 1991. The impact of the peso's devaluation in Argentina has affected everyone. Inflation in October alone increased by 6%, affecting the prices of basic products. During the last year, inflation grew to 50.1%, higher than every prediction made by members of Mauricio Macri's government. The government is trying to keep the economy under control until next year's elections. And if it means destroying people's purchasing power and increasing tariffs, then they'll do it. Macri is not ruling for the people who have no money to eat and are being forced to fit the neoliberal vision. A poll from Argentina's economic and political center shows that sales of basic product were reduced by 64%. Compared to other years, prices rose by almost 100%. We are living a very concerning situation, especially for the smallest sectors. Each time people are buying less products as poverty increases. Even in middle and high class sectors, the living standards have worsened. High levels of inflation in 2018 has made consumers buy less meat, milk and vegetables. Purchasing of these products was reduced by 65%, while fuel saw a decrease of 39%. High levels of inflation affects the economy in general. That's very irresponsible and has revealed the failure of the government. They keep increasing tariffs and reducing currency to control inflation, and that doesn't work. Mauricio Macri's government hasn't been able to stop inflation or the growing concern of people. The price of basic products showed the size of the crisis. People keep losing purchasing power and can expect it to get worse in the future. For 2019, inflation is expected to be higher than 27%. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Riots have broken out in Zambia's second largest city after rumors spread of the government selling a state-owned company to a Chinese company. However, a government spokesperson, Dora Sililla, has dismissed the reports that Zambia Forestry and Forest Industries Corporation has been sold. She said the government has no intention of selling the company. Meanwhile, police have reportedly arrested 83 people in connection with the riots. The government of the Democratic Republic of Congo has been accused of allowing torture of political and human rights activists by security forces. A report by Freedom from Torture Group accuses the authorities of routinely carrying out gang rape, beatings and electric shock treatment on detainees. It also stands accused of detaining activists in inhumane conditions and holding them without charge. Security forces in Egypt have killed 19 militants linked to a deadly attack on a bus carrying Coptic Christians last week. The Interior Ministry said 19 militants were killed in a firefight with security forces. President Fatah Abdel el-Sisi called Coptic Pope Tawadros II to offer his condolences to and held a minute silence for the victims. And now it's time to bring you more stories from around the world. 
China has kicked off an import expo hosted by President Xi Jinping, who pledged to open up the Chinese market amid accusations of playing foul on trade. The president promised broader access to its economy by allowing increased imports and lowering tariffs. He also promised to clamp down on intellectual property infringements. In his opening speech, he condemned U.S. President Donald Trump's policies. There are only better business environments, not best. All countries should strive to improve their business environments and solve their own problems, not always finding fault with others while glossing over their own, like shining a flashlight at others and not themselves. The lawyer who helped acquit a woman accused of blasphemy in Pakistan has fled to the Netherlands to save his own life. Saiful Muluk defended Asia Bibi while she was on death row since 2010 for allegedly insulting Islam. The case has already led to assassination of two Pakistani politicians and sparked widespread protests by Islamists calling for the judges responsible to be killed. Muluk says UN staff urged him to leave the country. He confirmed that he doesn't know the whereabouts of Bibi. At least 21 protesters have been injured by Israeli forces at the Gaza Strip. Palestinians have gathered in support of the launch of a flotilla called Freedom Ship 15 that set sail from the port of Gaza to try and break the Israeli siege. It was forced to return by the naval forces. They were fired on with tear gas and live ammunition. The wounded and those suffering from tear gas inhalation were taken to the local hospital for treatment. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And also join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.